So an official welcome to everyone for joining us for this English faculty roundtable today as we talk about Courseware and OER solutions as pertaining to English. Around the table, we have uh, myself, I'm Elizabeth Spica, I'm the Lumen Director of Teaching and Learning. We also have Heather Angel here, who is our Platform and Product Manager for English and Communication. Heather, thank you for being here. And we also have faculty member superstars, Karen Forget, Andrew Davis, and Guy Kruger. This is a team from the University of Mississippi who are really instrumental in developing the courseware that we're looking at today, and we're excited to dive in with them. So thank you all for being here. Today we're going to be talking about and taking a closer look at Waymaker, which is our personalized OER course solution for English. So Waymaker is one of the three OER course types that Lumen offers. The other two that you can see here are Candela, which is a basic e-text replacement, and then over on the right side, OWN, an open math homework solution. So regardless of the course type, as part of our mission, you can find all of the OER course content that we've curated for these courses. It's available at lumenlearning.com. And so as part of our mission with Lumen is not only to share and further the OER efforts, but faculty and institutions choose to partner with Lumen because we really help them scale OER. So in addition to curating and enriching, adding to, creating uh, some really tightly knit OER content, we also offer a secure platform and integration so that you can deliver OER content at scale and directly within your institution's learning management system. We also provide course design, implementation, and ongoing support to faculty that are using OER in the classroom. That's just a little bit about what we do. We wanted to focus on Waymaker today because it comprises these elements that learning research has really shown to be effective. So Waymaker takes a mastery-based approach to presenting this enriched OER content that we've curated. So in addition to having OER content, you're going to find it within this personalized approach, this modular approach, that gives students frequent opportunities to practice and show what they know, and it's going to give them personalized feedback. So in addition to that, you as the faculty member, you can enjoy a suite of analytics and a dashboard that's helping you figure out which students aren't engaging with the materials, which students are struggling. And then as part of that, we've also got some really cool faculty messaging tools that are individualized to the student. So these are going to help you reach out and build connections with your students that are really trying, but still just not making it in your class, but also to pat the ones on the back that are doing a great job. And so we know that that's making a huge difference based upon some research that I'll show in just a second, and the research is also available at lumenlearning.com. I wanted to show you very quickly an example of one of those automated messages that Waymaker is set to send. So if you have a student that is in, in the content, but not exactly, uh, doing what they should be doing in terms of engaging with these practice activities, and when they're not making a very good grade on their quiz, you as the faculty member will automate this message that you've customized at the beginning of your semester. And so you can see that message down here at the bottom. This is actually from a 2016 fall economics class using Waymaker. And you can also see how the student responded. So here the professor was able to customize the message in their voice. And then Waymaker automatically populated the student's first name, the areas of their struggle, and then the message from the professor. So all of this makes the professor's life easier, as well as helps them build the connections with their students. On the flip side, here's an example of one of those good job messages that I referenced. So Waymaker also automates these. There's enough stuff to do in a class to keep up with the students that are toward the bottom end of the spectrum, that oftentimes those that are trying very hard and doing a really good job, they can get skipped over. So Waymaker helps you build connections with those students as well by automating these nice course messages. So as you can see, this, uh, this made the students day. We're also very excited to show and talk about Waymaker because we now know that effectively delivered open materials have been proven to improve learning outcomes just as much as some other publisher and copyright restricted counterparts, right? So this is data from a study that we did in fall 2016 with an introduction to business course of over 5,000 students. And we were really excited because this is showing us that those things that I just mentioned, the personalized approach, the faculty connection tools, all of those things are making a difference for students. And most of us are familiar with what's called the Pell penalty, this gap in performance 
for students that are Pell eligible versus their non-Pell eligible peers. So what was exciting for us was to see that of these students, the students that were Pell eligible had almost no difference in their grade with their non-Pell eligible peers. Whereas those students who did not have the tool, they performed lower and saw pretty much what we would expect to see traditionally as you look at this uh, this Pell gap and the Pell parity. So this is letting us know we're moving in the right direction, that a simple e-text is not necessarily enough to uh, improve student outcomes. And so Waymaker is really meant to take OER to the next level and fill that gap. As far as OER for English goes, Women Learning offers a number of courses that are set up and ready to go in both writing and literature. When it comes to Waymaker, we have a spiral designed three-level approach that starts with basic reading and writing. This is really foundational and basic skills. And then level two it is more of a developmental course when students have the foundation and the basics. This is our introduction to college composition course. And then level three, which is the college level composition course. There are also supplements available at all of these levels. So we have a reading anthology, and then also a writing style guide for those who are used to having a style guide like Shrunk and Wide available. This can be paired and is actually embedded in all of these ready-to-go courses. But we also find people using the style guide in areas that are even outside of English. So um, that's been very beneficial. What we're going to focus on today is a Waymaker for Writing that was developed by this Ole Miss Superstar team that I'll introduce in just a moment. And to also let you know the whole gamut of our operations here, we also have basic ebook formats for English Composition 2, American Literature, English Literature, Technical Writing, and a few other writing-related courses. These are sourced from a variety of different OER uh, sources that you can see here over on the right. But of course, in addition to using sources, we've also enriched those, used subject matter experts like the team at the University of Mississippi to really make something all its own that is um, packaged and ready for your students. As far as the learning outcomes go, when I talked about those three levels, these are really also following the Bloom's taxonomy levels. So within each of these courses, we focus on reading, writing, and research, with the difference being that with these same outcomes, that level one course is really focusing on identifying all of these items and these outcomes. So this is your basic fundamental content, and then level two would move into that level of analysis for these same outcomes. Level three, our college uh, composition course, that is now up to the evaluation level. So as you see and look at these and, and see each one here, especially when they're used in a sequence, this can provide some really nice consistency for both the student and the instructor in terms of providing clarity around the structure of the course and the objectives, as well as give you a nice um, foundation to scaffold and build upon that students are familiar with over time. Within each of these courses are also modules for grammar and success. Sometimes instructors use these modules. Sometimes they elect not to. They might use them selectively or even diagnostically. But um, they are folded into each of these courses and available. So grammar is often not part of the standard writing courses. So we find it helpful to include these just so students can reference and learn and reinforce some of the skills that they know. And of course, success skills, these are things that really should be embedded all across all curricula. But we do have them here in English and in several of our other courses as well. So that's the basic breakdown of English. And now let's focus in on Waymaker and how it's been working for the superstar team over at the University of Mississippi. So as I mentioned, they were the masterminds behind the Waymaker writing course that we'll be looking at and then talking about today. And this is a great picture of them um, as they were given a, a team award for their collaborative work as they transformed their own writing 100 and 101 curriculum using Waymaker Adaptive Courseware. So this is a great picture of uh, Karen Forget, Guy Kruger, or guys, guys over here, and then uh, Andrew here in the middle there with their um, chancellor and provost, and then also the uh, Educause, Educause with Dr. Megan Duff. So Karen, Guy, Andrew, thank you for being here. And uh, without further ado, let's dive into the conversation. So I think to open the round table, Let's take ourselves back and look back on your journey to OER and then maybe just provide us some background 
as you were looking toward OER and making your move and transitioning, what problems was Ole Miss looking to address? And then from that, what really drew you all to Waymaker and to Adaptive Courseware? Um, so uh, our story with, with adaptive technologies goes back several years, actually. We, um, uh, we have the benefit of having worked together for several years on a few different projects um, and uh, the benefit of some failed work, uh, which has really helped inform what we were looking for uh, and why we feel like we're on a successful path now. Um, so we started... Um, uh, 2012, I think, mm -hmm. um, working um, with some folks um, from Carnegie Mellon on um, a project where uh, to to bring um, adaptive learning into the composition classroom. Um, we've gone through a couple of different iterations of that, um, and most recently, in the past couple of years, we worked with faculty from four other schools, three or four other schools. Um, um, on a type of collaborative project where we were trying to develop um, uh, different uh, assignments to work through a whole genre, a whole unit. Um, and one of the problems that we encountered there was that we felt, we felt like there are certainly some universals in the composition classroom, certainly some things that we all could agree on. Um, but we, but we also found that there are, uh, you know, our students are our students. Um, that, that we have a unique local situation, and that we wanted to, uh, and we have unique local teachers, uh, and that we wanted to create products that were um, very uh, made for these teachers, made for these students, um, and and focus on that first. We certainly think that what we're doing is applicable beyond our campus. Uh, but we wanted to start with the questions our teachers had and the problems that our students were facing and then see how that branched out instead of trying to work the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and so we started with feedback from our teachers. Uh, we surveyed our teachers and asked them what they thought they were spending too much time in the classroom on that would be nice to have um, some sort of digital technology helping them out, um, helping them uh, work with their students on these particular areas. Um, and that is uh, that was kind of the uh, the moment that led us to uh, some of the stuff we've designed. Um, and then I'll let uh, Andrew talk a little bit more about why Waymaker. I think there there we've all got some reasons there. Right, and and I think that the the OER piece was really important to us, maybe for a reason that is not often talked about. And when you're talking about OER, particularly with administrators, faculty, and students, it always comes down to cost. But for us, it was really the flexibility and adaptability of the license of all of these source texts so that we could take content from all of these different places and adapt it specifically to our local needs um, and, and make something that fits pretty closely to the needs that our faculty stated that we have. Um, and and with, with copyrighted or, or license heavy texts, you can't really do that. Uh, so that's kind of why the OER piece fit really well with this project, and, and we, we like the Waymaker's overall approach to adaptive and personalized learning because in a lot of ways it's a much more minimalist approach than some of the other vendors, but what it does, it does really well, and it, it fits the needs that we have without overburdening us with unnecessary data, unnecessary technological hurdles, things like that. Uh, it, it really matched specifically kind of the philosophy of our program and what uh, our teachers were looking to do in their class. Mm -hmm. And I think like many, you know, like anyone, other institutions would have, we have some, fac uh, some faculty that are certainly afraid of, of a lot of technology. Um, and so like Andrew's saying, we, you know, we are able to control what we, what we give to our teachers instead of throwing a giant uh, resource with so mm -hmm. many different possibilities at them that I don't that, that I think would intimidate them. Um, we're able to scale it to the level that's helpful for us and build that up or down as, as yeah. needed. All of that makes sense, and that's kind of the beauty of OER, right? You know, you all were able to get something that had your own local flavor that was specific to your student population, and then, like you mentioned, Andrew, it's not limited by licensing restrictions 
and then it's pretty much the gift that keeps on giving. You can continue to develop it or you know change it as you see fit. And then the third piece that I liked was the simplicity of it. You know, I was talking with someone in the state of Virginia today, and he was a, a dean of business there, and he said, you know, I, I want to tell you this is, and this is not a, uh, it's not a dig, but this is very simple, but I mean that in a good way. And that I considered quite a compliment because there are a lot of complicated things out there, and just because it has bells and whistles doesn't mean that it's going to be any better for the student population. And really when it comes to these course materials, that's not what's center stage. I mean, the material that they're there to learn is center stage, but the technology and all of, you know, the, the flash and the splendor around it, that should really take a back seat to the experience that they have with you all in class. Right, and, and, and one thing we realized, I think, is this is kind of the, the third iteration of this project for us, is that we shouldn't be inventing problems to solve, and we shouldn't go about designing things to solve problems that don't exist. Because composition classes are really small, there's already a level of personalization built in to what a composition class is. There are high contact courses where the experience for each student is personalized. So we thought, given that, what are the kind of ancillary parts of the course that maybe we could address using an electronic tool like this that would allow the personalization that's already happening to be even more relevant or even more informed for each student. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, and I, you know, I know we'll get into some of the other, some of the specifics in our classes, but I think to build on that point about technology, in, in other iterations, I think we've spent a lot of time talking about the technology itself, and I haven't had that experience um, in what, what we're doing so far. We talk about content, and that's what's yeah. important. Yeah, good point. And uh, on that point, speaking of content, uh, let's move to talk now about the process of setting up the course, um, how it was working with Lumen to set it up, and then how you all ended up structuring it to begin with. And for everyone uh, who's here or watching the recording, just so you know, you can find all of the content that this team developed here at courses.lumenlearning.com backslash Ole Miss Writing 100. And so this URL will be on our next few slides to give you some time to copy it down. But uh, as you all talk through the course setup, I'm going to go off of the PowerPoint and just go actually into your course. I have a copy of it here, and so I can drive around to kind of point out things that you're referencing. So, well, I think that just as a prelude to uh, what's in the course, we serve a wide-ranging population of students who come in with a variety of levels of preparedness and certainly a variety of levels of um, the understanding of rhetorical content knowledge, things like rhetorical terms and rhetorical strategies. So when we were designing the course, we were really trying to um, provide an opportunity to kind of level the playing field for our students. So the material that we, that we worked with to build the course was designed as review for students who might already be familiar with these terms and these strategies but then also as a way to bring students who had no idea what these terms or strategies were and no experience with them, to bring them into the conversation as well. So when you look at the content, you'll see that um, for some students, this may seem um, more uh, basic understanding of rhetoric than it, than it would for other students. But that was intentional in our design of it. And even still with those students who, you know, who have uh, maybe more prepared, I think sometimes uh, uh, so they may think they know more than, <laughs> than they actually know, too. So there's, uh, I, I found that with a couple of my students this semester, I think it's been helpful even for those who, who are more prepared. But Karen's absolutely right. I think your um, graph earlier on kind of uh, bridging the gap with the Pell Grant students is, is one of the things, we, you know, that type of thinking is something that's gone into our design. So when we were setting up these modules, we were thinking of it in terms of the projects that, that we teach, and we tried to design them so that there would be um, a module per week within each project that would really speak to what the students would be doing at that time. Um, so our early project really kind of asked students to uh, enter the kind of uh, discourse that college requires. So those early units are about, uh, you know, 
what kind of rating are you going to have to do for this? And what's organic structure like in college? And then what are the demands in terms of uh, readability and precision? And uh, then through the rest of the semester, the modules themselves speak to the projects that students are working on. And by the way, if I'm not a good driver, just let me know and I can uh, pass the screen share over to you all. Um, but I, I did like what she mentioned is that you really designed this as well around those things that you knew your students struggled with, but that you didn't necessarily have time to uh, address in the classroom or to address with each and every student because this might not be applicable to each and every student. Yeah. Right, and, and time was part of it, but also the, the beauty of this tool as opposed to just reading in the textbook, which certainly you can do, but the beauty of this is that there are exercises embedded within the short reading so that students are practicing mm -hmm. the skills as they read. And I think that uh, can't be understated, particularly for underprepared students, because that's when they really get the sense of um, whether they really are understanding mm -hmm. what the material is or not. Yeah, so at the University of Mississippi, we start our first year writing courses with a common, uh, common reading text project. So our students are all given a common reading book over the summer, uh, and they come in. Uh, the expectation is that they've read that, and we dive into an assignment on that. Um, so the rhetorical reading um, makes sense for what we're doing, but really, to go back to what Karen was saying, the rhetorical reading is really an ideal starting spot no matter what, because essentially what we're talking about there you know, uh, we may be using a common read to do it, but for any text we're talking about, here are the expectations for college level reading, uh, and, and students are start kind of gauging where they are on that spectrum based on their high school experiences or independent reading experiences. Um, you know, it's no surprise to anyone that we, you know, many of our students, uh, as, as many across the country, are passive readers. Um, so even those who have read, um, um, more than others sometimes are reading it passively, taking in information and regurgitating that information. And so we want to work with them right off the bat on being critical readers and engaged readers and thinking, uh, uh, taking in the material but thinking about that material um, and thinking about how to apply and make meaning out of that material. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's foundational for so much college work. I mean, really, if you look at that, that module is designed for the stuff that we're doing in our class, but I think teachers in other disciplines w would be uh, excited about that type of material that, that, that would help the students engage with the stuff they're reading all across the, the, the campus. Yeah, the other thing that we really stress in our um, first year writing courses is metacognition and really uh, reflection, trying to own your own learning process. And in the screen that um, Elizabeth just had up, you'll see that students have the opportunity to sort of evaluate their own understanding. So they'll, they'll take a um, they'll make their response and then they'll have to answer, how sure are you about that? Which for us, particularly because these are students who are just coming into college, is, is an important way for them to practice that idea of thinking about their own learning processes, thinking about their own thinking, and um, kind of being their own best friend in a way, in terms of, of really engaging with how well they're understanding things. Yeah, I like the way that you, Which, that you put that. Oh, I'm sorry, Guy. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, to say for the, the people that are watching here that this quiz is embedded within each module. And this is part of that mastery-based idea that frequent practice and these formative assessments, these are part of the learning process. So students can take these as many times as they want. It doesn't go into a grade center. There are separate graded quizzes that sync with the Blackboard gradebook. But you all as the faculty are getting information about how students are performing, what their confidence levels are, and whether they're even engaging with these practice activities. Right, and we, we, we sort of built three levels of interactivity into the course. Uh, at the base level, there's lots of practice interwoven throughout each module. Uh, some of these are built using uh, Lumen's quiz engine. Some are built using a platform called H5P, which is a, an open source tool to develop interactive assessments. Um, yeah. But the idea is, is to try to have as much interactivity on each page as possible. 
just because that keeps their attention and it does kind of prevent this this passive reading. Yeah. Um, and and it, it gives them a feeling of accomplishment having done something. Mm -hmm. Even if they aren't getting a grade or credit for an activity, it's it's that gamification model that, you know, gotta get to the hundred percent complete on an activity just for the sake of completing it. Um, and this this right here is an example of one of the the H5P modules, and this is just a little uh, flashcard where they have to type in the definition that they think, uh, and then they get to check the definition to the actual definition. Um, and again, this doesn't gear, carry any points or any weight, but it's a more interactive way to teach something than just having a chart with the fallacies. Okay. Um, so and we worked Justin Bieber into this, too. <laughs> One of the cards has mm -hmm. Justin Bieber picture. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's important to note that the, the level of content here is not really rising to the level of a textbook. And we didn't want to replace a textbook. Uh, this is not the textbook. It's really meant to highlight those specific areas that we want to pull out and focus on. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. You know, one of the things that uh, from our failed projects that we started to think about was um, it's very hard across campuses to duplicate a composition course because it does respond to local needs. But the one thing that was apparent across all courses was that uh, specific content knowledge isn't very well either understood or measured in typical writing classes. And we weren't doing it either. That's no, we're, I'm not calling anybody else out. We didn't do it either. Mm -hmm. and, and so this kind of became that space where, just as you would in a more content-heavy class, where you would talk about terminology and the strategies that people use, this became the space for students to um, read a little bit about that, practice that outside of their own writing, and then judge how well they were understanding the strategy. And, and you know, that's a hard thing to do. You, once, when you read a student's paper, either the student has engaged the strategy or has not, it's very hard to judge. So the, does that student understand the strategy if he hasn't engaged it, or has he just failed to engage it? So this is kind of our in-between space where we can think about does the student seem to understand what that is? And if so, why isn't it showing up in, the, in uh, his or her papers? Yeah, and so in, where this really manifests itself or can is, is conferences. And so I've been doing that today. And it's very interesting. Uh, my students are working on argument. And just a couple of times today, I've been able to look at their results in, say, a unit like using sources or evaluating sources and ask them, how that informed their choice of, of particular sources on their paper or how they integrated, uh, integrated a source. And I'm getting information that lets me know uh, they weren't entirely sure about something they completed in the module or um, it helped them think about those things. You know, this is, this is information that we didn't have before that can, that can feed those conversations and conferences or, as Karen said, when we're looking at a final product, have a sense of are they getting this or not getting this. Um, so there's a, uh, you know, and, and filling in gaps uh, that, that have, have we've had in the past. Well, and I think not only does it fill in gaps for us as, as their instructors, but also for the students themselves. Definitely. And I think a lot about my students who really are frustrated because they feel like their writing isn't getting any better as they continue through the projects. And there are lots of reasons why that that is for students, and it's hard to explain it to them. but. They can look at their progress in these content-specific areas and say, well, maybe it's not showing up so well in my paper, but I am learning things. Mm -hmm. And I am, um, there's knowledge that I didn't have before that I'm really, that I have now, which I think is important, particularly for students who are frustrated with their own rate of progress. Yeah, that sense of progress is super important. And what you mentioned is certainly a benefit. And you know, as we move to talk about the experience for the students and for the faculty, I know you all had a, a pilot with this in the summer, and then now you've been using this to scale, basically, with your entire faculty team this fall. So can you speak to how it's going for you, um, the other feedback that your students have given, and then even how this has compared to what you've done previously? 
Yes, so we are at um, uh, a rollout of, uh, oh, we just gave these numbers, 60, 60 sections? About a thousand. Yeah, yeah about a thousand students. Uh, teachers. Yeah. Um, so, um, which is good news. So, you know, what we have at this point is anecdotal, so we can talk about some of that information, but what we will have at the end of the semester will be more uh, substantive, too, because now we have a chance to get um, feedback from those teachers, feedback from those students, and let that inform uh, how we build out and, and or modify from here. Um, anecdotally, uh, the experience has been very positive. Um, and, uh, and and I expect some of the, the, the survey data and so forth to, uh, to confirm that. Um, so we know, just like I was mentioning a, 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 you know, a little bit ago, we know that this does give us more additional, uh, additional information to um, inform our conversations with students and, and, and vice versa. Uh, as Karen mentioned, this also gives students additional information to uh, inform the work they're doing and their questions and their uh, um, uh, progress. Um, also, I think that um, one of the benefits of the type of rollout that we're doing right now is, you know, Karen and Andrew and I have done a lot of work on this and we work well together. As you can see, you gave us an award for working well together. Um, but, uh, you know, we see things through our lenses as three of us, you know, we work together closely a lot anyway, and so the, the expanded faculty gives us a variety of viewpoints, experiences, different students that they encounter and work with. All of that will help inform, um, you know, where we go with this. And so I think it's, it's crucial that we got beyond ourselves um, and, and can let some of that information help us, help guide us to where we're going. Now, having said that, um, I've, I've heard some positive things about what's happening, um, uh, but we don't have complete data on all of that yet. Um, um, let's talk a little about that. I, I will say that the one thing that we know has been very smooth is students being able to access the materials they've been vetted within Blackboard. Mm -hmm. it, it's been a no-brainer for them, which with other things that we've used in the past has not necessarily been so. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the, the things we're really interested in, I don't think we're quite ready to to talk about those because we haven't really assessed mm -hmm. them yet. Mm -hmm. um, and guys, right, we have a lot of anecdotal data, but uh, we we don't have any assessment data particularly right. yet. One thing we do is, um, as Karen mentioned earlier, uh, metacognition is a big part of our curriculum, and so we do have students reflecting a lot. Um, I know some of our teachers, myself included, uh, we ask students to reflect on the work they've done in the modules. Um, I think that that is interesting, uh, especially when I think about, we, we also do what we call unit reflections, which is where we have a student think about their whole experience um, from the start to finish of a particular paper or, you know, my, you know whatever it is. Uh, so an analysis paper or an argument paper. Um, to me, it's been interesting to see how students mention learning certain material and then thinking about how that's applied in their paper. So, and again, this is stuff that uh, we've never had. Uh, we've never had access to that kind of process and thinking um, before. We've never, um, uh, you know, we've taken it for granted that they either have certain knowledge or don't um, uh, in terms of rhetorical content knowledge. Um, and so being able to kind of put a finger or, or get a pulse of where that, where that uh, you know, what that knowledge is and how they are going about applying that, I think it's one, making for or at least the potential for richer reflections for these students because they can think about how it informs their process, um, but then to informing um, uh, us more too. And like I said, we don't have all that full set of data yet, but, but so far I can tell that that's, that's been an interesting component of my class and I'm, I'm looking forward very much to seeing final reflective products and getting final thoughts on that. I will say one thing um, about writing teachers they tend to be really suspicious of anything that's multiple choicey <laughs> um, mm -hmm. because they spend a lot of time writing papers and, and rightly so. That's kind of the that's the um, bread and butter of our work. So I think we do have some we'll have some interesting conversations to have with our teachers and with ourselves about, you know, what do we feel comfortable with in terms of this type of measurement, which mm -hmm. isn't mm -hmm. what we usually do. It's new 
different for us. And it's even different from literature classes where they give reading quizzes and stuff like that. So I would say that's one area that I think we're going to have to have a lot of discussion about and think through um, with our faculty. And I'm interested to see what happens with that. Um, and if you want, I can point to something very specific, which is, uh, and this is really interesting because this is where, you know, all the work you do in the lab, uh, you know, kind of comes to fruition at some point. I, I vividly remember us this summer talking about, Karen in particular, talking about students writing things like, research says this, and being vague about where they're getting information. Um, and we did, a, we did a peer review in my class the other day, and we're working on an argument paper. And um, I, I can't tell you the number of times that I, I was looking at peers' comments, other, other, their, their other students' comments on their peers' papers, where there would be somebody mentioned as a source or research, that, and, the, and the students would be writing, who is this? And what research? That kind of thing. And it's because they had just, I, I, you know, they had just been working in this using sources module where the module reinforces this idea of you have to establish who a source is, what's their credibility, that kind of thing. Um, and you could, I could really see that coming to life in this peer review process. Um, so, you know, and I know there's others, like I said, we don't, we don't have a full set of that stuff, but it's those kind of specific things that I think are really interesting to see coming to life. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I mean, that, that's kind of what makes this, this project different from our previous attempts, is that we finally realized that it's futile to try to build a personalized and adaptive system that actually works with student writing. The technology doesn't really exist yet, and if it does, it's in a very different field. I mean, there's lots of work in natural language processing, machine learning, and, and those uh, science-y type areas that will eventually trickle down to ed tech, but it's just not there yet. And we ended up building these systems that were really superficial, and even though students did write into them, it didn't ultimately tell them anything about their own writing. So we looked at this as okay, what are we teaching in these classes that is not specifically writing on the page? There's lots in the composition class that's not about writing on the page. So this is really designed to address those things. Um, and in that way, I think it, it's a little bit more um, friendly to teachers who would otherwise be suspicious of it. Because it's not taking away from what teachers already do. It's leaving them more time to spend on those things they already do. That's a good point, and you've mentioned several things here. Um, I I appreciate your comment, Karen, about you know that the place of multiple choice. What is that place? And it sounds like you all have found a pretty good place for it um, in this capacity in terms of triangulating those multiple choice related exercises with other reflection papers. And really, um, I think it's empowering to know that the student reflection papers, and since you all are having them engage with this so critically that because this is OER, what they say matters and their reflections are inevitably going to affect how you all end up, you know, iterating and changing this for the future. So I think that that's really empowering and I'm sure, you know, as we move to this last little bit about advice to other faculty members, you mentioned earlier about involving your faculty team and so getting them involved from the beginning to identify the problems and the directions and then, as you mentioned, having the students involved as well, and all of that going together as a community to really create something that's special um, as you all move forward. In addition to that, before we go to the Q&A, um, what other advice would you give to faculty who are looking to embark on an adventure like this with a personalized learning and OER? Well, I think our biggest a uh, piece of advice is probably to consider your local situation. And I think Andrew made the point really well when he said to um, not invent problems mm -hmm. <laughs> that don't exist and to think through where are the gaps. Uh, and, and even though that seems like it should be pretty easy to do, it wasn't for us. It took us a while mm -hmm. to figure out what our gaps were. So I, I guess that's what I would, that would be my biggest piece of advice. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I'm finding uh, uh, about working with adaptive or personalized technology is that, you know, I know I know what I teach, I know my discipline well, but it's very interesting to see how work in other disciplines can inform what we're doing. So, I mean, I would recommend to talk to other people on your campus who are using 
um, certain technologies in their classrooms or in their disciplines, see mm -hmm. how those might be, how they might fit or might not fit in what you're doing. Um, you know, like I said earlier, we've, we've yeah, I don't want to say failed, but we've, we've ended up where we didn't want to be in a couple of different iterations of what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And that has informed what we're doing and talking to other people what we're doing. So, I mean, to think that we could just sit down with an idea yeah, and make it work perfectly the first time around is, is, is too, too idealistic. Um, uh, be prepared to, to, to work through some problems. Be prepared to talk to others and, and find out, uh, you know, uh, some of those pitfalls before, uh, beforehand. Well, and, and I guess my singular advice to individual faculty members, and maybe this is a little pessimistic, but be very wary of vendor sales pitches, especially from <laughs> from other players in this market who will come in and show you very elaborate and flashy dashboards and really sleek looking interfaces and platforms that are going to suddenly solve all of these problems that you didn't know that you have. It, it's just a smoke screen. Um, a lot of that, that's not going to solve any of your problems. That's not going to do anything but create more noise in your class. So when you go in to hear these ed tech vendors, really focus on what are your specific needs and how does the tool that they're offering meet those needs. Um, even if the tool, and like in our case, this is not the most flashy looking platform out there, um, but it meets a specific need. Um, and it, it doesn't overwhelm faculty members with extra stuff that might look cool, but really isn't doing anything for them. Yeah, I think that's such an excellent point. And I remember uh, when we were first, my kids and we were buying strollers. And the best piece of advice we ever got was to buy the thing that's just the stroller, not the stroller and the car seat and the baby mm -hmm. bouncer, just buy the stroller. And I think it's the same thing with this. Is identify what you want to, what you want to do with this, and then buy, use the tool that addresses mm -hmm. that need. Well said. So, so um, stay true to the needs and then consult your community. And I think those are great advice for people who are looking to embark on this. Um, as we go into Q&A, I just wanted to put the uh, URL, and Heather's also put this into our chat too, and then also to provide the email addresses um, of Karen, Andrew, and Guy, and then also myself, Elizabeth, and then Heather, who's our content guru when it comes to English and communications courses. So feel free to reach out to us even after this webinar if you have questions. So um, at this time, yeah, and, and I know you're starting the Q and A too. And let me add to that, speaking since you're, you know, uh, providing these people from Lumen. You know, we we've communicated well with the people from Lumen. Uh, make sure that whoever you're you're teaming up with, partnering up with, that they understand your needs, that they have people who are dedicated to that, that they communicate with you. So um, you know, part of the success that we're having right now is I think that we've uh, um, gotten good support, received good support from the mm -hmm. folks at Lumen, and uh, that's that's essential. Um, you know, the, 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 a lot of this depends on a lot of, of, of things falling into place. Mm -hmm. So we need it. We need that. Great. Thank you all, and thank you for joining us today as well. We really appreciate. It. I know that uh, Guy, you have a class starting in 15 minutes, so thank you for uh, you know winding over here and taking this time to connect with everyone. No problem. Thanks to the whole team at Ole Miss. And then as I'm looking over in the chat, it looks like uh, Heidi is typing, but it may not be a question. It may just be a thank you. So um, I don't see any other questions. And Heather, if you've had anything come up, feel free to uh, pipe in here. But just know that we will circulate this recording. We'll also circulate the slide deck as well. And then um, as a follow-up, we also have this great uh, handout that um, the team at University of Mississippi has put together. And so Heidi does have a question. She says she teaches at a community college where they have outstanding supplementary resources like a learning lab and modules that the library has posted to measure understanding of plagiarism, research skills, et cetera. So what does Lumen offer that's different from what may already be available? And so the beauty of OER, Heidi, and um, Heather, I can let you speak to this as well, is that because everything is integrated in your LMS, you can use the foundational content and the content offered by Lumen, and then layer in these modules that you know and love, like your library guides and other things that your own institution has created. And so those can run right in line in, uh, 
And so it's not like an external site where you have to go over here for this and then go over there for that. And um, everything is just, as we said earlier, it's right there in the forefront. There is no distinction between, you know, what's Lumens, what's the libraries, what's that. When everything is in the LMS, it really becomes centered around what are the learning materials. And so while we cover all of those things that you mentioned, um, we do have some other things, and I think Heather will be following up with you to kind of give you an idea about what specifically um, may differ. And in one area, I can see for research skills, plagiarism. Um, I do believe we also have Waymaker modules that cover that. And then as we were looking at in the beginning, these ideas of research, writing, reading, and then also grammar and success skills. Um, these are going to be places where we may um, align with what you have, but then it may also be a different, uh, a different flavor of the same thing. And really when it comes to that, it is all about depth over breadth. And so um, the right combination of these things really gives your students a, a good scaffolded experience. But we'll follow up and then if well, you, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that a little bit from, from another perspective. You don't want to undervalue the importance of someone else hosting all of your work and putting it together. And I, I think it was, was Dave, David Wiley, who's Lumen CEO, posted something about this in a listserv a few weeks ago that, you know, one of the biggest threats to OER and OER content is that it gets lost. And I know from personal experience that we've had problems with websites at this university content on the library website gets lost, it gets corrupted, someone deletes it. One advantage to going with uh, a provider like Lumen is that you can take their OER content and combine it with the content yeah. that your library has already made and print it somewhere that's going to be secure, that's going to be maintained, and that you're going to regularly be able to work with in despite the, the changing environments of the library or the department or the Center for Teaching and Learning and all of these different elements that might control bits and pieces of your resources. Compiling them all into one place is really an advantage for, for teachers that want to take on this challenge. That is a good point. And then I guess the other benefit is that when it is available in the platform, that also contributes to the mission of open access and then sharing the work, you know, so, so long as it is open or licensed to be open. It's sharing, and then that is then able for capable for other people to come in and to use it and to build upon it as well. And so it just really furthers this mission that's near and dear to pretty much everyone's heart that's entered education in terms of access to information and knowledge. Heather's added a few different um, style guide reading anthologies, and there's links there that you can check out. And then we'd be happy, Heidi, if you just want to send us, you know, a an outline of what you all have, and then we can get off the room from that. Great. All right. Well, thanks to everyone for joining us. We will circulate the PowerPoint and the recording. And if you have any questions or want to reach out to any of us, the team at the University of Mississippi or the team here at Lumen, here are our email addresses. And again, we really appreciate you taking time out to join us today. Thanks again. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.